our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. And as we get into this wonderful book. We know that your life will not remain the same. Therefore, we ask you to invite somebody to join you. So that together we can learn of what the Holy Spirit has prepared for us. But before we begin today's session, I invite, let's get into this moment and dedicate it to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Yes, Lord. We open our hearts to receive it. Yes, Lord. Let it work in us mm. as a double-edged sword. Mm. Let it bear fruits in us, King of Glory. Yes, Lord. Let it cause us to go out and act it out. Mm. That everyone that hears this word mm. will be convicted mm. to run with this message of the cross. Yes, Lord. The message of salvation. Yes, Lord. The message of the only God and King of Kings, mm. Jesus Christ. Mm. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Our text will be taken from the book of Romans. Chapter 4. From verse 1 to verse 8. This is what the Bible says. <coughs> what then shall we say? That Abraham our father was found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, wages are not counted as grace but as date. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of, him, of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. This is a wonderful text that we just read. And here in this text, we have three personalities coming to the front. In verse 1 to verse 3, like it's a courtroom setting, we see the witness of Abraham being justified by faith. Then in verse 1, verse 5, Paul comes up with his testimony of being just of justification by faith. Then in the last three verses, we we'll see David coming to the front to also bear witness of justification by faith. So how does this all 
bind together. I need to take you back to where we began the justification by faith process. In Romans chapter 3, from verse 21 to verse 26, Paul introduces the instruction to us. The doctrine of justification by faith. And, and then from 27 to 31, he gives us the implication or the outcome of us being justified by faith. Now he brings the illustrations. So he now brings to us the witnesses of to elaborate on what this justification by faith is. Basically, he is not trying to give you the theory without the practice. And then he begins by saying, what then shall we say? That Abraham, our father, had found, was found according to the flesh. And what's amazing is this. He goes back to the Old Testament. He goes back to the beginning and brings out a prominent person justified by faith. And this establishes what we have long ago for long pronounced to us, that the doctrine of justification by faith is not New Testament theology. It goes all the way from the very beginning. God has always justified men and women on the basis of faith. And so, what we, do we need to understand about Abraham? When God found Abraham, Abraham was not a believer. His name was Abraham. Then he was an idolater. He was wicked. He was not holy before God. So the question then that comes to the front, how can a man how can a woman or how can a person who is not holy who is wicked be made right before a righteous God how do you find acceptance before God a God who is holy and you are sinful and that is the question that is being addressed in this text and here say Paul goes on to say that if Abraham was justified by works then he has something to boast about. So what is the point he's trying to drive home here? That Abraham's justification was not based on his self-righteousness all his moral standing all his, or his standing before God being perceived as good. So from a point of salvation, Abraham did not contribute to his salvation. Either in part or in full. <laughs> so that is the basis. He says, so 
he did not contribute anything. So there is, he did not purchase his own salvation. And that is the point he is trying to say. And he uses the word not before God. So not even his best deeds would guarantee that right standing with God. So there was nothing Abraham could do that would merit that favor before God. And that's what Paul tries to emphasize. That Man at his base, from the very beginning, does not measure up to God's standard. Now, having stated that, he goes back to what the scripture says concerning Abraham's justification. And look at what his dick states. He says, Abraham believed. God. And it was credited to him for righteousness. So Abraham who was pagan. Abraham who was a sinner. Genesis 15, 6. When God makes the promise to him. He believed God. That's the only thing he brings to the table. He believes God. Yes, his life is wrecking with sin. He's a wretch. But when God made the promise, he believed God. And his belief in God, or his taking God at his word, and believing, it was credited to him for righteousness. That is what Jesus points out. John chapter 8 verse 56. When he brought the context of Abraham with regard to faith, he said, your father, speaking to the Jews and talking about Abraham, he said, rejoice to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So in essence, Jesus is trying to say that Abraham was the recipient of the gospel. Because at that point when God told him to look at the stars, and count them. And he told them, so shall your seed be. And he is talking to Christ. And he believed God. So he's believing. That is all that it required. And what was the result of his believing? What was the result of his faith? The Bible says it, this was credited. So his believing what God said was credited to him for righteousness. Now let's look at that word credited to him. Because in chapter 4, it is the word that we encounter time and time again. I actually did a private study and counted how many times it is used. All implied. In in chapter 4 alone, I counted nine times that this word was used. Now, for us to understand the word credited, let's understand it from the Greek. The Greek word is logizomai. Now, logizomai is an interesting word. Because for those of you who have 
worked in a financial sector or have done some bookkeeping. This is where it all comes in. Logizomai would imply credit to the account of. So that would mean that you are posting to an account. It means you are putting something to someone's account. Today we are living in an age where you have so many accounts. You have an account with the bank. So when you come, to, you go to the telecos, they also open an account for you. So when you need need to pay your electricity bill, they open an account for you. So if it is utilities like water, again an account is open for you. If it is television, again an account is open for you. And so what happens? In order for you to enjoy this service, this is what has to happen. There has to be credit on your account. But if there is no credit to your account, then you cannot enjoy this service. So they will request you or the service provider will require that you credit your account. And when your account is credited, then you become a beneficiary of that service. So this is, if you are looking at bookmaking, you have two sides of a ledger. So it is moving an amount from one side to the other side. So, so you move it from the debit side and then you have an amount credited to the other side. So that is what it means to credit. That is where logizomai comes in. Let's take it to the spiritual aspect. So logizomai in the spiritual spiritual aspect would mean God now takes the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and credits it to the account of the sinful person who believes. So when you believe what Jesus has done for us at Calvary and you believe that this is your propitiation for your sin. God then credits your account of unrighteousness with Jesus' righteousness. Yeah, so that, that's what happens. So when Abraham believed, it was credited to him. So it was credited to him. Now, I, I want you to note that it is not it was credited to them. <laughs> so Abraham at that time had a wife. <laughs> the Bible does not say when he believed God. <laughs> then God credited to them. <laughs> him and Sarah. Uh -uh. It doesn't say then God credited to him and his lineage, Isaac, Jehovah, and everyone. No, it is not to them. The credit is to him that believed. Later in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, 
We see that by faith, Sarah herself also believed. <laughs> so the crediting of righteousness is not the a collective people. It is to the individual who believes. So what that means you and I must come to that place of each believing on their own. I cannot believe for you. As a father, I cannot believe for my family. Every member of my family has to believe on their own. As a pastor, I cannot believe for the congregation. Every member of the congregation has to believe on their own. And the Bible says, and Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him to his account. So to the Abraham's account, the perfect righteousness of God was credited. He could do nothing. He couldn't earn it. It wasn't by works. It was purely an act of grace by God. So what was credited to him was the righteousness of God. And, and that is also important for us to understand. The Greek word there is the word dikaiosini. Now that means come meeting God's standard. And we saw previously that this is equivalent to the glory of God. Why do I say so? Because the book, the Bible says in the book of Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the standard is God's glory. So when we come short of the standard, that means we are coming short of the standard, which is the glory of God. Now you have to understand that there is a certain portion in scripture where it is stated that God is a jealous God and he will not share his glory with any other. <laughs> so what is this? So that means you cannot even work for that. No, God has to give you. And it is an act of faith that causes this transfer to happen. I have had a lot of people who say that, no, you see, the righteousness is credited at the end of time. That is not the case. It is not the case with Abraham. It, it, the Bible says he believed God. Past tense. And it was credited. Past tense. It did not say he believed God and it will be credited to him on the last day. This was the transaction that God made. When Abraham believed God, God credited to him a once for all transaction. His righteousness. Now I would take you forward to the New Testament to give you an, an example of where a credit was made on account of somebody else. And that is the book of Philemon. Now Philemon has uh, 
It is a short passage, but it is an amazing one. In here we find a slave called Onesimus. Now, Onesimus had run away from his master, Philemon. And once he runs away, he encounters Paul. And along the journey of life, he gives his life to Christ. Now, Paul sends him back to his master, Philemon. And when he sends him back to the master, he writes a letter to him explaining to Philemon what had happened to Onesimus and how his life had drastically changed. And in there, he writes, he appeals to Philemon to reconsider as he looks at this young man, he says, but if, and I will quote verse 18, he says, but if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. In other words, <laughs> Credit it. In other words, it will be my account that will be debited. That your account be credited. In other words, Onesimus is not in the equation here. So Onesimus is not crediting anything. <laughs> He's not paying anything. He's not working for anything. This is an act of grace. And you see, this is what God does for us. When we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, he is saying, yes, I will pay it all. I will credit what is due Basically, what God is saying here, this is what I demand. My glory. But I will credit your account on the basis of your faith in Jesus Christ. So, so, and this happens instantly. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ and it is by faith, by faith alone in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. So no one else does it. The church cannot do it for you. The, the pastor cannot do it for you. No, no organization can do it for you. This righteousness does not come from anyone else. It comes from God himself. It belongs to God himself. And it is given to anyone who places his faith, who places her faith in Christ Jesus. Then Paul continues with his testimony and he brings onto the scene a contrast, a wage and a gift. And he says now to him who works wages are not counted as grace but as date. So he says if you 
engage somebody to do something for you at the end of the assignment and you, you are paying them. You cannot call that a gift. That is a remuneration. That is a wage. They have worked for it. They have labored for it. And because of that, they can boast about it. Because this is a product of their sweat. But look at what he says. He says that is not an act of grace. That is not grace. That is date. Why? Because they have worked for it, they are indebted to you. So, it, if somebody came to work for you and you are paying them, you can't say, I'm giving a gift. Yet, on the other hand, if you meet someone and you out out of mercy, you take money out of your pocket and give them. That is a gift. They don't deserve it. They've not asked for it. They've not worked for it. So faith, when we believe, Look at what Paul explains in verse 5. He says, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. So, you cannot work for your salvation. No, it is a free gift that God who justifies the ungodly. And ungodly is the word asebes, which means wicked. Somebody who is wicked, somebody who is irreverent of God. Now God comes to the wicked, who is you and I. And because we have placed our faith in Christ Jesus, then justifies us. So that faith, he says his faith is credited to him. So in other words, it is transferred to him as, as righteousness. Praise be to Jesus. Then he moves to give us another example. So we have seen Abraham verse 1 to verse 3, verse 4 to 5, Paul gives us his witness. Now 6 to 8, he brings David to the scene. And this is what he says, just as David also speaks speaks of the blessing. And the blessing he's talking about is the divine favor of God in salvation. And says, just also as David speaks of the blessing on the man whom God credits Righteousness apart from works. And what is he quoting here? It is a scripture we saw previously. Psalm 32. Verse 1 to 2, where he says, Blessed are those whose lawless sins have been forgiven. Now look at the word blessed. That is the opposite of being cast. So you see, to be blessed, that means you are not cast. The antonym for blessedness is being cast. So to be blessed, that means you're under God's unmerited favor. You have found acceptance with God. 
Hallelujah. And says, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And verse 7, he goes on to add, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Now, lawless deeds is an interesting one. When you see lawlessness, that means there is a law. And the law has been broken. So here he refers to the breaking of God's law. And the lawless deeds, that means their actions done. Which are contrary to what the law states. So it is not a one-time offense. <laughs> this is a continuous life of sinning. But it says, this blessedness, God imputes righteousness apart from works. And what happens? <laughs> the, the lawless deeds that have been committed are forgiven. Now, forgiven is an interesting Greek word. The Greek word there is the Greek word afiemi. Afiemi is an interesting one. Because what Afien means, it means to send away. So that means you now stand. When you stand forgiven, it means you stand and your deeds of lawlessness are sent away. You stand apart from your deeds of righteousness. So you stand before God with your lowest deeds taken away. For, for you to understand this, you need to go back all the way to the Old Testament. And in the book of Leviticus, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kapul, on that Day of Atonement, this is what used to happen. There are several sacrifices that were made. A bull was made for, was slaughtered for the sins of the priests. Then an animal was slaughtered for the people. I bring to our attention verse 7. They bring to the front two identical gods. Two identical gods. And then a lot is cast. So one god is to be brought before the Lord. The other god is the scapegoat. So now this is something God is doing or instructing Israel to give us a picture, an illustration of how God treats sin on how he handles sin. And I want you to see what happens. Then Aaron would lay his hands after the Lots have been cast. So they would tie a scarlet cord and tie it around the neck of the goat that was to be presented before the Lord. And they would take a scarlet cord and tie it around the horns 
of the God that was to be laid away. Now, what would happen is that the priest would lay his hands upon the head of the God that was to be presented before the Lord and pronounce the sins of himself and all Israel. And then he would lay his head, his hands on the head of the God that was to be taken away. And then pronounce all the sins of Israel and himself upon the head of this God. So what is going to happen now? Then the God that was to be presented before the Lord would be sacrificed, would be slaughtered, and its blood shed. And that speaks of Christ shedding his blood as a perfect sacrifice. Then look at what happens. Then the other God is led away and they find a suitable man outside the tent who would then take it away to an uninhabited place. And that God was not allowed to come back to the camp. It would forever remain there to show how God treats sin. Now look at what happens. What does the praying over demonstrate? In Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah tells us that he laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So our sins were laid to him. And this happened at Calvary. Now you need to understand then what happened to these sins. And this is the demonstration that the, the other scapegoat brings to us. He, he carries it away. Another portion of scripture is in Isaiah. Even in so the first scripture that I'll bring to your attention is in Psalms 103. Where he says, as far as the east is from the west, so has he taken our sins away from us. So, so it is that separation that God wants to bring to this. That when we talk about forgiveness, it bears with it the fact that our sin has been sent away. And if our sin has been put away, then it also brings the mindset that the curse has been taken away. Because forgiveness not only removes the sin, but forgiveness does also remove the curse. So it cancels the date. So the date of sin is paid for by the penalty of sin. And then the Bible goes on to say, David brings another revelation and says, and whose sins are covered. So basically what is happening is your sins are not just taken away, but they are buried in the sea of God's forgetfulness. Your, your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God remembers them 
no more again. And once you understand that, <laughs> that not only are my sins cancelled, not only are my sins sent away, they are covered. Do you know what that means? That means God no longer sees them. They are covered. Covered by the blood. They are concealed. And it goes on to say in verse 8, Blessed is a man who has seen the Lord will not take into account. Again we come back to the verb that we use, the Greek word that we use, the, the, according to righteousness. We come back to the crediting aspect. So what is God trying, here trying to tell us? He is trying to say that the blessing comes because now God does not credit you with unrighteousness. But he credits you logizomai with his righteousness. So here he says, blessed is the man whose sin is not taken into account. <laughs> so, so your sins are nowhere to be credited. Well, when they look at the ledger of your account, <laughs> they, they, there is no credit of sin. No. That has been removed. Now you have a credit of God's righteousness. So everyone who comes to Christ, God will not take into account, will not credit him with his sin. Because when you believe in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. It is sent away. It is covered. The date of sin is cancelled. And here you stand in Christ Jesus, forgiven by God. Let's look at three imputations or three implications that we have observed in this text that we just read. And this comes for us understand the whole aspect of sin. The first imputation is what happened to Adam. When Adam sinned, Adam, that sin now was credited to his account. That act of disobedience was imputed to his account. And what happens thereafter? So that means this sin is immediately charged to every account of every individual who comes through Abraham's, who comes through Adam's reigns. So that means everyone born of man has a credit of sin to the account, which is the sin nature that we talk about. So, and therefore Romans comes to us in 5.12, and we look at it in detail when we get there. But look at what he says. He says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sin. That is imputed. That is the imputation of sin. Now, Adam, Adam, through him, all humanity 
have imputed sin have imputed unrighteousness now look here this is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, talking about Jesus, who knew no sin, to be seen on our behalf. Now what happens? Peter says that Jesus bore our sins in his body upon a tree. First Peter 2.24. What is happening here? This is now a transfer of sin from the unrighteous to the righteous one. So, at that point, when you believe in Christ, the third imputation comes. So, now, what happens is that then the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus is now transferred upon everyone who believes. So you see, when Adam sinned, Adam sin was transferred. And all, therefore all sinned. At the cross, there was that transfer from Adam to the last Adam. Now, when we believe in what happened at the cross, then we have another transfer. What is now imputed to us, what is now logizomai credited to our account, is the righteousness of God. And that is the exchange I want you to understand. And this is not by works. This is by faith. And here we have the witness of three persons. Abraham, Ibrahim, David, Daudi, and Paul. Testifying to us that justification is by faith alone in Christ alone will you receive that one. That is how your sins are washed away. That is how you get to be forgiven. Therefore, if you are listening to us, watching us, you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Today, believe on Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And in an instant, God will credit your account. His righteousness will credit your life with his glory. Because Christ has borne your sins on a tree in his body. The Lord has laid upon him the sins of us all. When we believe that, we receive God's righteousness. Why don't you say this prayer with me? Say, God in heaven, I thank you for the gift of salvation. Salvation apart from works. Salvation that comes by faith in the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work. I acknowledge I'm a sinner and I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me, Lord. Guide me, Lord. Teach me to live this life for your glory, for your fame. Thank you for saving me. 
Amen. Amen. Now, if you say that prayer, right this moment, you are the righteousness of God. Your account has been credited by God with his righteousness. And he has not imputed upon you any act of unrighteousness. Your sins are forgiven. They are covered, buried, out of sight, sent away from you. Now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We have a request to make of you. There is the number on the screen. Please call. Tell us what God is doing. And for you who is out there, who is being blessed week in, week out, please share the testimony of how liberating this is for us so that together we will celebrate God's goodness, God's act of grace to all mankind that is found in Christ Jesus. So from Dominion Church, it's been a blessing to have you with us today. So we say, until then, Shalom. Amen.